The texts of the New Testament are not without an agenda, but you know this. But do you know about some of the agendas of others in the first and second century Mediterranean? In this video, we're going to talk about Romanization and formative Christianity, and that's coming up right now. It is all too easy for people to assume that Christianity is anti-Roman. Archaeological, textual, and social scientific scholarship has gone to great lengths to help us understand how the rise of Christianity actually depended upon the developments we associate with Romanization. And it is true that Christians posed problems for the imperial project, but the problems aren't as cosmic or mammoth as the New Testament would have you think. We have to remember that Rome was a massive empire that ruled upwards of 75 million people. The proportion of people who identified with Jesus in any way, shape, or form in that time was especially small, from half of 1% to 2% in the most generous of estimates, and that is by the mid to end of the second century. That said, the accounts we have of Christians being in conflict with the state help us to see some of the tensions of identifying with the Roman Empire and the Kingdom of God. Our discussion of the Roman Empire begins with Julius Caesar and Octavian. That dynasty continued on with a number of emperors, including Claudius. Among other things, Claudius is famous for completing Rome's famous aqueduct and other major infrastructure projects. This was a key component of furthering the Pax Romana. Another key component was settling conflict among the diverse groups that were under his control. We have historical accounts of him doing this in Alexandria, Egypt, between Jesus and non-Jews. And yes, you'd be right to recall that void left by the absence of Alexander the Great's death and the rise of the Ptolemies and their defeat. Unity is a hard thing to maintain. We see this in the writings of the Roman historian Suetonius, who describes Jews in Rome disturbing the peace in relation to someone named Crestus. This led to Claudius expelling them from Rome. But who was Crestus? Some scholars have taken this to be a misrendering of the name Christ. This would go along with the expulsion account referenced in Acts chapter 18, verse 2, where Aquila and Priscilla, a married couple who were leaders in a Roman collective allied with Paul, were described as having been expelled with the rest of the Jews there in Rome. The jury is out on whether Crestus is indeed Christ. Regardless, it is a useful reminder, though, of the premium at which price was held in the Roman Empire. The infamous Emperor Nero, the last of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, could be understood as pursuing peace at all costs. It's not uncommon to hear he was a megalomaniac who built self-centered architectural models to himself. Christocentric assessments of him favor these interpretations as he blamed and violently persecuted Christians for setting fire to the Golden Dome in Rome. We learn this from the Roman historian Tacitus. But as an episode in the Great Fire of Rome in 64 CE, among other struggles, Nero proved to have little handle on peace, leadership, and security, and had himself killed, perhaps in shame. Outside of Rome and toward the end of his reign, we saw Nero further losing his grip. Places like Judea and elsewhere were seen as becoming increasingly reluctant in their tributes to the empire. That is, the client-king model used by Octavian led to a kind of laxness. In Judea, for instance, there was a question as to whether the temple was doing enough to honor and bless the emperor in rites and finances. Nero sent General Vespasian to bring order to the region. But upon Nero's death, Vespasian returned to Rome to take the mantle as emperor, beginning the Flavian dynasty. The name Flavian may be familiar to you from the Jewish historian referred to as Flavius Josephus. He's called that because he was a Judean prisoner of war under Vespasian. Emperor Vespasian eventually released him from slavery, and Josephus took the dynasty's name as tribute. And in addition to writing about Jewish history and customs for the emperor, Josephus was an associate of Vespasian's son, the general Titus, who destroyed the Jerusalem temple, the stronghold of Masada, and other Jewish holdouts in the first century CE. Titus eventually succeeded his father as emperor, as did Titus' brother, Domitian. The Flavians reinforced the idea of the empire's greatness, minting coins and building monuments as a sign of stability in the Pax Romana. In Rome today, you can see the Domitian-era Arch of Titus, which features the inscription, the Roman Senate and people dedicate this to the divine Titus, Vespianus Augustus, son of the divine Vespasian. 
The imagery furthermore shows the spoils of war, including most notably menorahs being carried off. The Flavians double down on their role as Pontifex Maximus. Many students are amazed to see this kind of textual and artifactual witness to the world of the New Testament, but we shouldn't let it inflate our view of Christianity's relative significance in the time. We have evidence of imperial indifference to Christianity as well. In the beginning of the second century CE, the Emperor Trajan was suspicious of guilds and other collectives because they could lead to a socio-political divisiveness. Having his, his ministers keep an eye on all of this, he received word once from a governor in Asia Minor named Pliny the Younger, who had apprehended some Christians and wanted advice on what to do with them. Trajan told him not to worry, but just to make sure that they pour out libations in honor of the emperor, to get punished for any wrongdoing that they did, but treat them fairly as anyone else would be treated in the empire. So the idea that Christians were against Rome, that the world of Rome was at odds with Christianity is somewhat out of balance with what we know of the time. Even when Jews like Simeon Bar Kokhba, son of the star, used cosmic theological imagery to call for the overthrow of the Romans in Judea in 132 CE, the Emperor Hadrian had little trouble putting down the rebellion. The Second Jewish War, as it is known, saw Hadrian expel the Jews from the Jerusalem and rededicate the temple to Jupiter. Meanwhile, Hadrian had extended his rule as far east as Britain, where you can see a Roman-era wall to this day. I say this as a reminder for us to be mindful of the charge of terms like parousia, eschaton, and apocalypse. Beyond their theological relevance, words for second coming and end times and revelation provide us with opportunity to consider statements of social power at the crossroads of Hellenism, Romanization, and Second Temple Judaism.